Greetings. My name is Barbara Foreman, Professor of Education and Director of the Regional Educational Laboratory Southeast at Florida State University. With me today from the RAL Southeast are Lori Lee, Manager of the Improving Literacy Alliance, and Nathan Archer, Communications Director. Today I will present an overview of the practice guide from the What Works Clearinghouse called Foundational Skills to Support Reading for Understanding in Kindergarten through Third Grade. I was chair of the expert panel for this guide. After my presentation, Lori Lee will briefly overview the Professional Learning Community, PLC, guides and videos developed by the RAL Southeast that accompany the practice guide. The URLs for the practice guide and PLC materials are provided on the last slide and after the webinar, we will provide a PDF of this PowerPoint, uh, but it will not have the embedded videos, so you will find those on the last slide on the IES YouTube channel. If you have questions during the webinar, please type them into the Q&A box on the bottom right of your screen. <clears throat> Nathan Archer will be monitoring the questions to address any technical issues that arise, and Lori and I will monitor content questions and address them at the end of the webinar. All of the questions entered into the Q&A box will be captured along with users' names and email addresses. This way, if we run out of time, we can address your question in a follow-up email after the event. Thank you for joining us today, and let's get started. First, we'd like to acknowledge the Institute of Education Sciences uh, National Center for Educational Evaluation for uh, funding our Regional Educational Laboratory Southeast at Florida State University. Um, the information that we will be providing today is not uh, meant as a mandate. You uh, can choose to, do, to follow these practices or to ignore them. First, the Regional Educational Laboratory Southeast is one of 10 regional laboratories throughout the United States. And you can see in this map of the United States the yellow co color-coded uh, region of the southeast with the six states that comprise this region. The Regional Educational Lab program establishes priority areas within each region and then provides access to high quality, scientifically valid research, uh, education research through applied research projects and technical support. The What Words Clearinghouse, uh, many are familiar with that, it provides systematic reviews of the evidence in various topic areas, but it also provides practice guides. There are 23 practice guides so far and seven of them are related to the topic of literacy, including the practice guide we're talking about today. These practice guides are geared towards helping educators and administrators address challenges in classrooms and schools. They focus on a particular topic. They're guided by an expert panel and based on, on rigorous research and then are comprised of evidence-based instructional recommendations. Here's a slide showing the seven literacy practice guides that have been released. We have some for younger students on reading comprehension, the one we're talking about today, foundational skills, and elementary writing skills. For older students, one on adolescent literacy and secondary writing, and for special populations, one on response to intervention and English learners. This is the front cover of the practice guide we're talking about today and the URL at the bottom. You can also simply uh, Google uh, Foundational Reading Skills Practice Guide and you will come right to it on the WWC website. There are three interrelated themes in this practice guide. First and foremost, the practice guide confirms the National Reading Panel's findings on the effectiveness of instruction in alphabetics that's phonemic awareness and phonics, fluency and comprehension um, and vocabulary. But it, it also adds an additional recommendation about the importance of oral language instruction 
and encourages the integration of reading and language skills. So this practice guide um, has recommendations appropriate to general ed students in grades K to three and in diverse contexts. So it does not consist of, of studies just for students in special education. Um, uh, it emphasizes general education. The, all, like all study guides, it starts with a comprehensive systematic review of the literature. And in this case, this practice guide updates the National Reading Panel literature review and goes from the literature from 2000 through 2014. 4,500 citations were identified in the area of literacy in K3. And then from those citations, the What Works Clearinghouse uh, uh, reviews the studies using the protocol that's uh, at the bottom bullet at that link and uses the systematic WWC uh, design standards which are very uh, stringent with respect to controlling for baseline differences, attrition, and, and other things. But from the original 4,500 citations, 56 studies met the design standards in this area of uh, K3 reading. Um, yes, let me just say on this slide, this is uh, listing the panel members. I mentioned I was the panel chair. We had other researchers. Uh, Mike Coyne, University of Connecticut, Carolyn Denton at UT Houston, um, Laura Justice at Ohio State, uh, Richard Wagner at Florida State, and then uh, we have um, uh, Joe Domino from uh, Small Business Group, Instructional Research Group, and then we had two practitioners, Warnique Lewis um, from Leon County in Florida Bond Elementary School, and she taught all the primary grades, and Linda Hayes, the director of the PK Young Developmental Research School. And Linda kindly let us work with her teachers to develop uh, the video clips that are embedded in this webinar, and also longer versions of all 38 videos are available at the link on the last slide. They're on the IES YouTube channel. So what does the practice guide on foundational reading skills recommend? It has four recommendations that are listed on the left, and you see their levels of evidence on the right. So the first recommendation about teaching academic language skills may, you may be dis disturbed that it only has a minimal level of evidence. But let me assure you that a minimal level of evidence does not mean that uh, academic language is not important. It means that a recommendation uh, needs more rigorous research in this area. And the panel felt that oral language ability was crucially important to understanding written language, which is why it is included. The other um, recommendations two and three have a strong level of evidence, developing awareness of the segments of sound and speech and how they link to letters which is the phonemic awareness as it links to letters. And recommendation three, teaching students to decode words, analyze word parts, and write and recognize words. Then recommendation four has moderate evidence. Uh, that is having students read connected texts every day to support accuracy, fluency, and comprehension. Now these recommendations occur in a developmental sequence so recommendation one on, on uh, academic language spans the entire primary grades, uh, K to three. The second recommendation, which is on uh, linking uh, sound segments to letters, um, starts in kindergarten, if not earlier. We're not covering uh, earlier uh, pre-K, though. But kindergarten through um, grade one, and then recommendation three, which is the decoding, word analysis, word recognition, and recommendation four, which is reading connected text in support of reading accuracy, fluency, and comprehension. They span middle of kindergarten through grade three. So for oral language, we use the term academic language, and you may be familiar with that term, but often 
people mean different things by that term. So here is a definition in, in the practice guide as the formal communication structure and words that are common in books and, and at schools. And then academic language skills are those skills that need to be taught to ensure that students can use and comprehend academic language. And academic language consists of these three parts. People are generally still familiar with the term academic vocabulary, and they're often familiar with the narr narrative language skills, which is the ability to clearly relate a series of events, but maybe less familiar with inferential language skills, the ability to discuss topics beyond their immediate context, to be able to predict and talk about future events or to be able to uh, comment on past events. And under academic uh, vocabulary knowledge, it also stresses the ability to comprehend and use words and grammatical structures common to formal writing. And I want to emphasize those grammatical structures include things such as compound sentences, subordinate clauses, adverbial clauses, prepositional phrases. And another element of, of linguistic structure that's important here are connective words. These are words that can connect uh, phrases within a sentence or across sentences, words like because, when, however, or um, the issue of uh, phone, uh, pronoun reference, uh, the word she, may appear in text and the student may say, what, who is she referring to, and have to reread the previous sentences to figure that out. There are also uh, structures called nominalization, where a noun in the previous sentence is replaced by a referent in a subsequent sentence. So what does that mean? An example might be the following sentence. When will self-driving cars be commercially available? This question is a hot topic in the media. And what does the word this question mean? Well, it refers to the previous sentence, the question of when will self-driving cars be commercially available. So the bottom line is academic language skills are important, and they can and should be taught. So recommendation one is teaching academic language skills. And in the practice guide, there are various action steps within each recommendation. So the first action step, engage students in conversations that support the use and comprehension of inferential language. And here on the slide, you have some prompts that you might use for informational text or narrative text. So when you look at that, first prompt for informational text, why do birds fly south for winter? Um, it's important for teachers to model um, how to provide reasoned answers that fully address the question and illustrate critical thinking. So if a student says, as an answer to that prompt, because it's cold, the teacher can encourage the student to restate the question and answer in a full sentence. Birds fly south for winter because it is cold. Action step two says to explicitly engage students in developing narrative language skills. And here on the right are some activities that are familiar to teachers about predictions, descriptions, graphic organizers, summarizing. Um, students need to learn complex grammatical structures and the specific elements of narrative language used to describe experience or events. This is often called story grammar. And more on story grammar can be found in the reading comprehension guides for grades K to 3, uh, that reading comprehension practice guide. So you want to model how to use each story element to connect and expand ideas and support student responses by scaffolding uh, the student's response. Action step three is teach academic vocabulary in the context of other reading skills. Now, here are some uh, 
good words to teach that are often found in uh, instructions in schools. And the panel suggests that schools or, or grade level teams develop common set of words that align with reading selections and curriculum standards for the year, words that appear in a variety of contexts and are unfamiliar. But in, in focusing on vocabulary, it's important to really build lexical knowledge or a rich semantic net network around that word so that word learning becomes generative. Otherwise, students can learn maybe 300 words that occur in their reading passages, but they don't learn any more than 300 words a year. So you want to be able to have a multiplier effect of teaching the whole semantic network around the word. We'll have an example a little bit later um, from derivational suffixes that make that point um, concrete. So here we have a, a video from a, a grade two, whole classroom. This is recommendation step three. What does honor mean? To give a person public praise or an award for something he or she has done. Excellent, good job. Every Veterans Day, we honor soldiers with a parade in our town. What's the word? Honor. honor. This time when I read it, I want you to say it with me when, it, when we come to that word. Our class uh -huh. performed a concert to honor our principal who was retiring. Who can use this prompt and fill it in for me? I have the oh, same no. hands going up. Ricardo. We honor our mom and dad by Mother and Father Day. Okay, did everybody hear that? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good job. Like, ah. We honor George Washington by putting him on a coin. Practice guides have potential obstacles and the panel's recommendation for dealing with those obstacles. So here is an obstacle. Students enter my classroom with a range of oral language skills. Some may not be ready to participate in academic language activities. So our advice is to, to uh, integrate the language into the small group reading activities, and that way you're not adding more time to an already very busy uh, English language arts block. Here is recommendation two. Remember, this is a strong level of evidence, and we see action step one, which is teaching students to recognize and manipulate segments of sound in speech. And this uh, activity here is, is a very basic uh, level of phonemic awareness where students are learning to separate compound words. This would be something that you do in, in the beginning of kindergarten. And it's important to appreciate the, uh, that phonological awareness is um, an intellectual achievement for young children. It helps them to become aware of the segments of sound and speech at the word, syllable, onset rhyme, and phoneme level. And this is critical for learning to read. Indeed, this grasp of what's called the alphabetic principle, which is a system for linking letters to sounds, is remarkable given that phonemes, the minimal unit of sound, is, is, a, is a psychological construct. That means when you say a word like bag, it doesn't have three phonemes that stand up and shout, here I am. You have to actually uh, separate those phonemes by recovering them. So if you contrast bag with bat, you see a difference in the final phoneme. If you contra contrast bag with sag, you see a difference in the initial phoneme. Bag with big, you see a difference in the medial phoneme. So this is not at all skill and drill. It's an intellectual achievement that's very important to learning to read. Here in action step two, teaching uh, students letter sound relations, you see a sample memorable picture and letter of the alphabet uh, for the letter P. And here, we will have a um, video tape of a K-1 whole classroom teaching letter sound 
relation. You get to learn a brand new letter sound. This is the letter sound that's made by the letter P. The letter P, it's a pig. The letter P says, just like this cute little pig. This pig is here to help us remember. This, oh, I'm so happy you know how to make it. Listen, this pig is a very polite pig. And he loves to eat pizza. And he loves to eat pie. So he always says, please, may I have some? Everyone, the letter P says, everyone make the sound. 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 Now, I'm so proud that you know those sounds. I want to see if you can use them to write. I am. The first word we're going to write is am. Get your board in your lap. Everyone say am. Am. I hear two sounds. Sound am. Am. Now let's write. Action step three for recommendation two is using word building and other activities to link students' knowledge of letter sound relationships with phonemic awareness. Word building is a very important step to understanding the alphabetic principle. And, and word building involves both decoding and encoding, which is very important because English, as you go from print to sound, is, a, is quite consistent, about 70% consistent for single syllable words, but less consistent when you go from sound to print, only about 28% consistent. So doing this kind of word building, going back and forth from encoding to decoding, really helps get to the depth of the English spelling system. Here we have some what are called Elkonin sound boxes. And you can use uh, letter tiles or colored discs to mark the unique sounds that hear in words. And so you have in this example, there are some letters put out in front of the student. The teacher says, take the F, A, and T tiles and put them together so that the F is first, the A in the middle, and the T at the end. What does this word, uh, what is this word? So the students say fat. And then the teacher asks the students to change a letter to make it say fan, and then change it to say can, and then change it to say cat, and then go back to fat. So this is making the alphabetic principle uh, productive for students. So what are some potential obstacles for recommendation two? Well, many students mix up letter shapes and sounds. What can you do about that? Well, focus on one letter at a time, then teach students another a letter or two while reinforcing the first. Finally, focus on the other letter exclusively, and then introduce both letters in different words. Another obstacle, many students have persistent problems with phonological awareness. Early interventions can often remedy this phonological core deficit that otherwise may lead to deficiencies in word decoding, which is a hallmark of reading disability or dyslexia. But the good news is that all struggling readers can uh, benefit from the same kind of uh, intervention, which can uh, amel ameliorate their phonological awareness problems and lead them on to successful word reading and comprehension. Recommendation three says to teach students to decode words, analyze word parts, and write and recognize words. This also had a very strong level of evidence. One question that came in was whether this is aligned to ESSA levels. Yes, all of the recommendations in this guide are based on the highest uh, level of evidence in ESSA and the Whatworth Clearinghouse. Anyway, action step one is to teach students to blend letter sounds and sound spelling patterns from left to right within a word to produce a recognizable pronunciation. Here you have an example of a pocket chart and letter tiles. And you're blending by chunking. So initially, you have three separate phonemes. And then you are chunking the first two. And then you are 
combining those first two uh, blended um, phonemes and adding the final phoneme uh, to get the word hat. And here we have um, a video, a grade one small group uh, video recommend uh, illustrating this strategy. So today we're going to make some words and read words that have the long E sound and we're going to learn some different ways to spell the long E sound. So this word is seed. What's the word? Seed. When there's two E's together in a word, they stand for the long E sound, the sound we hear in the middle of seed. So it says E. All right, so we're going to practice reading both words now. And when I touch under just the E-A or the E-E, you're going to say E. Meat. Seed. E. Meat. And so now I'm going to give you a little story, and it's called Up in the Trees. And the first thing you're going to do is you're going to look through it and see what words you can find that have the E-A or the E-E. -E. And you're going to underline them and read them as you do that, okay? You can sort of find E when you underline it too. Mm -hmm. Put it together. Some birds are easy to hear, but hard to see. Owls are easy to hear, but hard to see at night. Very nice reading. I like how you stayed together. Which bird is easy to hear, but hard to see at night? Which one is easy to hear, Addison? Um, owl. Owl. Let's look at the owl page. Why do you think they're easy to hear? Because they go like hoot. Action step two for recommendation three says to instruct students in common sound spelling patterns. This is enormously important. And on the left side, you see that students write letters in boxes as the teacher says them. So they have an idea that some letters have to combine and go in one box. On the right, the students are creating words by writing letters or moving letter tiles into the appropriate box. In the practice guide on page 25, you see a nice summary of all the consonant, vowel, and syllable construction patterns with examples. And it's also helpful to have sound spelling cards posted around the room, which help students see um, all of the variety of, of English spelling patterns for a single letter sound. So for the so-called long A, you can see that the words bake, rain, play, baby, ate, vain, great, they all fall under that one letter sound. Action step three says, to teach students to recognize common word parts.
Uh, before I move on, let me just emphasize the importance of morphology, because English is really morphophonemic. And English has spelling conventions for adding grammatical morphemes to words to, as suffixes, and those have to be taught, like doubling final consonants from begin to beginning, changing Y to I, as in happy to happiness. It, it, it simply needs to be taught. So action step four of recommendation three says to have students read decodable words in isolation and in text. Both in isolation and in text are important. This is a sample lesson on the diphthong OI, and you have to see OI words in a word list as well as in a connected text passage. Let me just take this opportunity to mention that OI as a diphthong is not a diphthong in all dialects of English. Um, if you, in the South and in Texas, uh, the word OIL is really just sounds like the word all, you know. So uh, this means that teachers need to be sensitive to their dialect and their students' dialect, and also that you should be aware that the core reading programs all have a Midwestern dialect. So um, this kind of knowledge about language really should be taught in pre-service teacher education. So action step five for this recommendation three says to teach regular and irregular high frequency words so that students can recognize them efficiently. You know, English operates at the whole word, the onset rhyme, the phoneme level, and there are these high frequency um, irregular words that simply need to be learned and sprinkled throughout the beginning reading program. I put in red font what most of the 56 studies on which this guide are based, these really high levels of evidence studies, agree on. Have students say the irregular word, like let's take the word of. Have them say it, of. Have them spell or write it, O-F, and then have them say the word again, of, to help them recognize that word um, quickly. Then to make um, interesting things to read, you know, you're going to occasionally introduce non-decodable words. And that's all right if you don't do too many of them. You can't expect a student to memorize all 480,000 words in a dictionary. So the alphabetic principle has to be explicitly and systematically taught, but doesn't mean you can't have some interesting stories about dinosaurs and put the word Tyrannosaurus Rex in there. Kids will love it. They will never forget that word. What are some potential obstacles to recommendation three? My students often invent spellings. Yes, what to do about invented spellings? Well, at the K-1 grade level, encourage students to write. Really important to have them write. Don't get hung up on their spelling, because at that point, you're really interested in uh, them writing, and they will be revealing their understanding of the alphabetic principle as they write. But with development, they will use invented spellings less frequently, partly because they're reading more, they're seeing uh, conventional spellings, and you will be teaching them those conventions, too. Encourage them to review their spellings for logic and to check word walls for spellings of frequently used words. And by grade three, ask students for the number of syllables in a word to determine whether the spelling looks logical to them. Here's another potential obstacle. Students are able to identify the sounds of the letters in a word, but they have trouble arriving at the correct correct pronunciation in the word. So you want to make sure you've taught that blending strategy I talked about earlier. You want to eliminate schwa sounds instead of saying buh. You want them to be very crisp, buh. And encourage students to be flexible with their vowel pronunciation in multisyllabic words so they come up with a word that they actually recognize. Recommendation four has a moderate level of evidence, and it's to ensure that each student reads connected text every day to support reading accuracy, fluency, and comprehension. And the first action step is as students read orally, model strategies 
scaffold and provide feedback to support accurate and efficient word recommendations. So here's some familiar prompts to apply uh, as students are reading, and it's divided into what to do for less advanced readers. Look for parts you know, sound it out, check it, does it make sense? And for more ad advanced readers, you know this word part, say this part. Now read the whole word. Um, the panel discourages students from guessing, like the first letter then guess strategy, or look at the picture. We discourage that because it's not an effective strategy for reading more advanced text. Panel also cautions against giving hints as if a riddle. What do you call the place where you live? Or the word home. As student skill develops, scaffold by providing fewer prompts and expect the students to apply the skills and strategies independently. So this action step is teach students to self-monitor their understanding of the text and to self-correct word reading errors. And this is uh, an example of a third grade small group uh, doing the fix-it game. We are going to do a lesson today when we practice making sure that when we read it makes sense. It has to look right, but it also has to make sense. And there's a question that might help you if you're reading. You can ask yourself, did that make sense? And if the answer is no, you need to go back and try to fix it. So it can make sense. Okay. We're going to do a game called Fix It to practice. On his birthday, he turned eight years old. Yours. Does it make sense? No. no. Who would like to share your thinking? Chris. It doesn't make sense because um, he was it would have to be changed to a O U instead of an E A. So it also doesn't look right to you. But does it make sense to say on his birthday he turned eight years old? No. no. Why doesn't it make sense? Because years and yours just doesn't sound the same. Great. Can you guys fix it? On, on his, his birthday, birthday he turned eight years old. Now does it make sense? Yes. Action step three of this recommendation says to provide opportunities for oral reading practice with feedback to develop fluent and accurate reading with expression. And here are listed some activities to practice reading fluently. Uh, individual, partner reading, choral reading, echo reading, alternated reading, or simultaneous reading. Uh, the panel um, suggests that Modeling and providing feedback to help students read text in a meaningful way rather than word by word is important. To use gradual release as students begin to read in progressively longer phrases. And use instructional level text and gradually increase the rate and accuracy. Both repeated and wide reading are important. And that leads right into this obstacle of how do I select texts that are accessible to all the students in my classroom. So the panel pretty much used the conventional wisdom of frustrational level text is more than 10 percent errors. Uh, in instructional text, the student makes um, 5 percent errors or less. And an independent level text um, is, is something where they're uh, number of errors is uh, far less. So you're going to have different texts for different students for different purposes. And you might have an independent level text appropriate for fluency practice. Or you might have a uh, frustrational level text that you're, you're using uh, for word reading practice with teacher support or for listening comprehension. In other words, it's important to read to your students uh, from text that's above their reading level so you can build their oral language vocabulary skills. For students with serious comprehension difficulties, select texts students are able to comprehend with support. So these texts are clearly written, well organized, with familiar topics. And then clearly more proficient readers can benefit from a te text above their grade level to keep them challenged and engaged. Another obstacle, my beginning readers can only decode a few letter sounds, so they rely on illustrations to identify words. 
our advice is to use decodable text so students can be successful and practice the letter sound and sight words, uh, high frequency words that have been taught. And then model sounding out not yet decodable words rather than having them rely on illustrations. And then tell students that are very uh, words that are very challenging or irregular and have them repeat the word and repeat the sentence. Another obstacle, I have limited time and resources for one-to-one -one instruction. How can I maximize my instructional time to, to provide each student with individualized feedback? In other words, this is the crucial question of how to differentiate instruction. And the, the panel advice on the screen is very good about providing individualized instruction and feedback, working in small groups or independently. And it's important to remember that independent and small group activities are most effective if the teacher has carefully taught the routine for the activity, has provided opportunities for students to practice with feedback, and then implement the routine regularly to maintain familiarity. And we need to start this work right at the beginning of the school year. Now I'm going to turn the webinar over to Lori Lee, who's going to talk about the professional learning community materials that go along with this guide. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Foreman. Thank you for providing us with such a thorough overview of the um, practice guide. Uh, we want to continue by uh, providing you with some information regarding the professional learning community materials that have been developed to complement the practice guide. And the PLC materials were designed to assist teachers in applying those evidence-based strategies from the practice guide to help K-3 students acquire the language and literacy skills needed to help students succeed academically. There are 10 75-minute sessions, and we'll talk about um, that a little bit more in, in a bit, um, but those, uh, that time frame is certainly very flexible. Uh, the components of the PLC include a facilitator's guide, a participant's guide, and accompanying videos, and you've seen some of those videos uh, throughout the presentation thus far. The facilitator uses the PLC materials to guide educators through a collaborative learning experience and to expand their knowledge base as they read, discuss, share, and apply the key ideas and strategies presented in the practice guide. We'll talk first a little bit about the facilitator's guide. You see some of the various um, components of the guide there on your screen. The purpose of the guide is to provide PLC facilitators with a game plan for conducting each session. The intent is for the facilitators to read the directions and then use his or her own unique style to convey the information, discuss the topics, and then provide explanations of activities. To prepare for each session, Facilitators should read the complete section on that session in the guide, as well as the related portion of the Foundational Reading Skills Practice Guide. It's very important that the facilitator is familiar not only with the PLC materials, but also the practice guide itself, as the practice guide is the very basis for the PLC. In addition, the facilitators should study and prepare all of the handouts associated with each session and gather any needed materials. We recommend that the facilitator would print out the facilitator's guide and then place the guide in a notebook so it's readily available. Next, we want to talk a little bit about the participants' activities. Uh, there's also a participant activity guide uh, for those that are engaging in the, in the PLC, and you see some of the elements of that on your screen. Uh, it includes the activities in which the participants will engage throughout their experience with the PLC sessions, and it's designed to lead teachers through those activities, and the participants' activities also serve as a basis of discussion uh, when the PLC meets. Participants also need to have the practice guide available to them. Uh, again, they're going to be engaged throughout the PLC with the practice guide itself, and so they need to have access to that. Uh, it's also recommended that each participant uh, print out the participant's guide, place it in a three-ring um, binder so they have that, again, available to them readily. Okay, just a little bit about the videos, and I know that, again, we've seen several, several of them throughout the 
um, course of the webinar this afternoon. Uh, we have a variety of videos. Some of them depict classroom situations as you've seen. Some of them are animated. Uh, they do require access to the internet, so in the sessions that um, these videos are utilized, you'll need to make sure that you do have online access. Uh, they illustrate the practices presented in the how-to steps in the Foundational Reading Skills Practice Guide. Uh, and I know that you will really appreciate the videos. You've seen some of them. Um, they depict real teachers in real classrooms with students, and they really truly show teachers uh, the recommendations in action. They show them what those look like. There are 38 videos in all, and they range in length from about one minute to about seven minutes, so none of them are very long. Okay. Here is an overview of the PL sessions themselves, the PLC sessions themselves, and you see on the left the recommendation from the practice guide. You see the sessions that are related um, in the PLC. So for instance, for recommendation one, you see that relates to academic language. You see there are three sessions that are associati associated with that. And you see the topics there that are related to those sessions. Now we mentioned the fact that um, the PLC is divided into 10 sessions uh, of approximately 75 minutes um, per session. And while that is how we've um, divided those sessions. It doesn't mean that the um, PLC has to be delivered in that manner. Uh, if there are topics that uh, the facilitator feels will require more time, certainly more time can be added to a session. Uh, if, however, conversely, there's not enough time uh, for an entire session to be conducted in a block of time, then perhaps the facilitator may need to divide a session and conduct it um, a half hour at a time or divide it into um, sessions that are shorter. So if that's the case, you'll end up with more sessions than 10, uh, but they will be, they'll consist of a shorter time frame. Uh, we would strongly suggest that as you uh, implement the PLC, that you um, conduct those sessions in the order that they're presented. Please don't skip around. Uh, the PLC has been um, developed to follow right along with the practice guide, and so uh, we want to make sure that um, that progress in learning how to read is represented, and so we, um, we really strongly encourage you to complete those sessions in chronological order. Okay. This is a, a page from our um, facilitator's guide, and um, if you noted a couple of slides ago, there's a process that the facilitator goes through through each session to engage the teachers. The first step in that process is debriefing. So there's a period of time when uh, the facilitator just engages the teachers. They talk about uh, what has happened in their classroom, what they learned about in the, during the last session. So that debriefing uh, takes place. And then the facilitator defines the session goals for this particular session. So that's step two in that process. Uh, what this slide depicts is actually step three, exploring new practices and comparing them to the current practices that are being um, incorporated in the classrooms. And so you see um, this, particular, um, this particular step is related to recommendation one and that is teach students academic language skills, including the use of inferential and narrative language and word knowledge. Note that the PLC really scaffolds the teachers as they do the work. So they are working in small groups. The, the facilitator is conducting a whole group discussion along the way. Um, the teachers are then reading and discussing um, aspects of the practice guide itself. So they're engaging in the practice guide. So um, throughout this step, the, the teachers are well engaged with one another and also with the content of the practice guide. Then continuing with this step, um, you see an activity uh, that um, engages the teachers in analyzing a sample conversation in the practice guide regarding a read aloud. And again, just as an organizational kind of tip, uh, you'll note that in that very first paragraph under number one, activity one, inferential language examples, that's bolded. 
And so for the facilitator, all of the activities throughout the PLC are bolded. They're numbered, named, and they're easily found within the materials for the facilitator. You'll also note that there's an icon that's represented in the lower right corner of the slide, and that is a reference to the activity sheet in the, uh, in the, in the participant's guide. So that's there, so the facilitator knows um, what that looks like. So the, um, the materials in the PLC are organized uh, very well, they're easy to follow, and so um, very user-friendly for our facilitators. We have in conjunction with this step, uh, for this particular recommendation, uh, a classroom video. And again, you've seen several of these videos throughout the course of our time together. Um, there are a wide variety of them. Uh, 22 represent classroom instruction. Uh, we're going to take a look at just a portion of this one. And this one uh, pertains to, again, recommendation one, uh, academic language. And it pertains to how to step one, inferential language. What you're going to see is a discussion between um, the teacher and students. And what has just happened in this um, classroom video for K-1 students is that the teacher has just read a text um, called Lions to the class. And that teacher is now facilitating an academic language discussion. So we're going to take a quick look at just a portion of this video um, centered around academic language. So let's go there. So this story, this book, it was about lions. What do you think? Are lions a wild cat or a cat that we could have as a pet? Think about this. I want you to turn to your partner and share what you think. share with me what your partner said, what you think about lions. Um, I think it's a wild cat because it lives in the wild. Okay. Albert? I think that lions are a wild cat because they live in Asia and Africa and they do a really loud roar and they're really big so they can't I like how you used what you already know about lions to think about whether they're wild or not. I think because if you try to keep them as a pet, they'll just destroy your house. <laughs> yeah, we wouldn't want to try that. So I want you to think about a cat that you've seen. It could be a cat maybe at your house, maybe near your house, or at a zoo. Think about that cat. Picture it. What does it look like? I want you to think about how you could describe that cat. If you're ready for the film. I like how you put the question and the answer together. You said, I can describe my cat as black with sharp claws. Okay, I got black. Let's see, who else can, we're going to take one more friend to share about a cat, and then we'll share with our partners some more. Aww. I describe a cat that it has a lot of um, um, gray fur, and it has um, um, green eyes, and it loves it. <coughs> 
Hi, Dad. I'm wondering what you and your partner talked about. You can share with me. How can you tell if a cat is wild or if a cat could be a cat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because because the wild cats they're really big and the and the pet cats they're really small. Why do you think it would be hard to have a really big cat as a pet? Because it might break up your house. <laughs> Um, if a cat is wild, it, it would, um, be so, it would, it would, um, it would be able to run really fast and not have to, and not be afraid just to go outside for like two days and then just come back inside. Now, Evan, you mentioned cats going outside. What do you think would happen if a pet, a pet cat that's used to being inside, goes outside? Do you think they would be scared? How do you think they would be feeling? North? Uh, I think I know how they would be feeling. Because there's a cat in my yard who mostly lives outside. Uh, I think when it rains, she feels really cold. And when it doesn't run, she she mostly just hangs around in my dad's barn. I think we would all agree that um, lions would not make good pets, and they certainly may destroy your house. Uh, so you can see again that action step um, incorporated in classroom instruction with real students and that instruction delivered by uh, a teacher in her classroom. Keeping in mind that those students were kindergarten and first grade students and they were using the names of the continents Asia and Africa as they spoke and so that's, that's really pretty impressive. Okay, uh, in association with the videos and again in the facilitator's guide, uh, an organizational kind of um, tip and that is again we're looking at recommendation one uh, related to how to step one inferential language. And in the facilitator's guide, you'll see um, a chart like this one. So in the green box, it indicates the number of videos that are related to this particular recommendation and the how to step. It uh, gives you the grade level of the video uh, that is represented there, gives you the activity that you are going to observe in that video, along with a bulleted description of what you'll see, and also delineates the length of the video. So the facilitator has all of that information right there at his or her fingertips. In addition, you see the sidebar, that rather blue, blo blue box, that has um, the key points about the video. And this is kind of a cheat sheet. And so certainly we would anticipate that the facilitator is going to preview those videos and have a good idea of what they contain before sharing them with the participants of the PLC. But that said, uh, this can serve as a really great reminder of what um, they're going to see in that particular video. So again, a great help to our facilitators as they work through the PLC uh, with, their, um, with their participants. So that's pretty much an overview of the PLC material. So we've looked at uh, the facilitator's guide fairly extensively, giving you some idea of really kind of how that's organized. Uh, we've shared with you the elements of the activity guide for the participants, and we've provided some detailed information about the videos that are contained uh, within the PLC as well. Before we move on, we want to highlight uh, a couple of resources that are also um, supportive of the practice guide. And you'll find those resources on the same web page as the practice guide itself. One of them is entitled Tips for Supporting Reading Skills at Home. And this is designed for families and helping them to incorporate some of those re uh, recommendations into their home environment. So that's available, again, on that same web page. Uh, in addition, there's a document that's entitled Evidence on Tips for Supporting Reading Skills at Home. And so the evidence is 
uh, delineated for those tips in the previous document that I shared with you. And so that is available for, uh, for you as well. And then also there's a practice guide summary also on that page. And the practice guide summary uh, provides the recommendations from the practice guide and a few activities that are related to each one of those recommendations. So it's, um, it captures the essence of the practice guide in a much more brief document. All of those, as I said, are available on that same IES webpage that you'll find the practice guide. So let's move on. Uh, again, we've shared a little bit about the practice guide itself, the complementary PLC materials that are available. And now I want to share with you just some other resources that have been developed by RHEL Southeast in the form of a literacy roadmap. And the literacy roadmap was developed around a framework thinking about uh, schools that need improvement, and especially in regard to those, implementing those evidence-based literacy practices. The roadmap um, makes a great deal of sense in the way it's presented in that it begins at the very beginning in helping um, users to understand a little bit about evidence-based literacy practices and why they're important. And let me go to that document and show you that in a little bit larger format. So here you have the roadmap. And again, we begin with understanding those evidence-based practices. And then it works through um, the ideas of um, ascertaining your needs, also talking about um, selecting evidence-based literacy practices, beginning implementation of those practices, and then shares a bit about also evaluation once those practices have begun to be implemented. Uh, this is the first page of the literacy roadmap. Uh, there's a second page, so there are actually seven sections to the roadmap itself. All of them contain um, clickable links, so when you click on uh, the title that's under each one of those sections, it will take you to a resource. There are icons that show you what type of resource, you, resource you're going to encounter. Uh, for instance, you may see a video. You may be uh, taken to an infographic, a website, or a document itself. And so those icons let you know uh, kind of where you're going in the form of resources. I want to share with you uh, just uh, or highlight four of these sections uh, because I think they may be particularly helpful to you. Uh, section 4 contains a number of uh, self-study guides uh, to help teams of um, educators at either the state level, a district level, or a school level begin to reflect upon and have some guided conversations regarding uh, what practices are implemented in their schools or districts or states presently, and then how well those practices are being implemented if there are other evidence-based practices that they need to consider, and then um, coming to a consensus about where they need to focus their efforts and their resources. And so uh, the self-study guides, they're available for a number of different grade levels. Uh, you can find them again on the roadmap. When you click on them, it will take you right to the self-study guide. And they do a great job of facilitating the conversations around um, the selection and implementation of evidence-based practices in literacy. Also, in Section 5, you're going to find some tools for selecting evidence-based instructional materials and strategies. Uh, there you'll find Dr. Foreman has created a video in which she shares the process of systematic review and what that looks like. Uh, she shares a little bit about um, the What Works Clearinghouse and the work that they do. And she shares a bit about the practice guides that have been published. Uh, in addition, information is provided in Section 5 about the systematic review of research on the effectiveness of adolescent literacy programs and practices, as well as a summary and analysis of evidence that supports response to intervention. And there's also a rubric there for evaluating instructional materials for grades K-5. And then finally, Section 7. Section, section 7 provides some resources for implementing evidence-based practices. You'll find under Section 7 a uh, link to the um, practice guide that we've been discussing this afternoon, 
Uh, there's also a link to the PLC materials that we've talked about. And there's uh, finally a link to a PLC for um, an English learner's practice guide. So all of those are um, there um, on the roadmap with clickable links where you can find those resources um, very quickly. And they are, again, in that framework, just leading you through the process from understanding evidence-based practice to selecting those practices to implementation and also then evaluation. So that um, is a little bit about PLC that um, complements the practice guide and then um, some other resources that we have available for you. All right, so I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Foreman at this point. I don't know that we have questions to answer that have been submitted. We're going to check on that for you uh, right now. And if there are questions that you'd like to um, just put into, enter into the question and answer um, box on your screen, you are welcome to do that. And while you're doing that, I'll just again highlight uh, there are two links on this slide, one to the practice guide itself. And again, if you Google um, IES practice guide on foundational reading skills, it will come up for you. Um, and then same thing, uh, there's a link to the PLC guides and videos. But if you will Google um, PLC on foundational reading skills, that will come up for you as well. So you can access those easily that way. Okay. While we wait for any questions to come in, um, I will just let everybody know that we are recording this webinar, and as soon as it's ready for viewing, I'll send a link out to all registrants. Thank you, Nathan. And we do want to um, just share, please feel free to contact Dr. Foreman or, uh, or me if you do have questions following the webinar that you think of later. Uh, please feel free to get in touch with either one of us, and we're glad to help in whatever way we can. Yes, we did have a question that just came in about how is this different from Orton Gillingham? Um, and a couple other questions like how, how are workstations incorporated and how is spelling support provided? Let me emphasize that the practice guides provide recommendations based on the research, but they don't give you a complete curriculum. So you would need to um, select your own curriculum. Um, but I would say the Orton-Gillingham uh, approaches are often used for students who are uh, really struggling with reading. And uh, they wouldn't be uh, appropriate for general ed classrooms or more relevant to tier two and tier three within the response to intervention or multi tiered systems of support framework that provide much more um, practice on particular sound spelling patterns. So they can be good resources for students who are really struggling. The question about workstations, um, that's, you know, we I did address one obstacle. The big challenge is differentiation. And what do you do uh, with the rest of the students while you're pulling a small group? And so you need to provide uh, relevant activities, meaningful activities for students to do uh, individually in partners and in small groups. Um, there are a number of materials available. One thing that FCRR, Florida Center for Reading Research, developed was student center activities. And you can go to our website, and they're freely available on the student uh, center activities. Here's another question that's come in. Our state has recently pushed a more balanced literacy type of model with alignment to uh, Common Core state standards, but it has markedly less emphasis on phonemic awareness, phonics, decoding, et cetera. What are your thoughts on this? Well, for students who come to school from highly literate households already knowing how to read, then great. You know, you skip a lot of steps and just give them great things to read. But unfortunately, that's not true for a lot of our students. They're not coming from literate households. In fact, they're coming with uh, a, a much reduced um, set of vocabulary words that people have documented. It starts, that gap in language starts very early um, 
the work of Anne Fernald at Stanford documents that are you know starting when students are one years of uh, of age. So we need to emphasize oral language, and as soon as students come into pre-K or kindergarten. Oral language is crucially important. That's why the first recommendation in this practice guide is all about academic language. But then for students who um, haven't been exposed to literacy or struggle with literacy, phonemic awareness is really important to emphasize because it helps them segment the sounds in speech to which the letters link up. And that can be a real roadblock for students. And Providing intervention early on, the earlier the intervention, the better for students who are struggling. You'll have much better um, results if you start early. And someone else asked about spelling support. Yes, yeah, spelling is crucially important. Um, you know, there are spelling programs available. Um, they are often uh, a third or fourth tab in a core reading program, and teachers don't have time to get around to it. But uh, I applaud the grade two teachers who really get to the depths of the English writing system, because those students are, are going to be much more uh, efficient in their reading because they've had that understanding of spelling. Let's see, do we have any other questions that have come in? No, I don't think so. Okay, so uh, we want to thank you for attending this webinar. And if questions come up um, after the webinar is over, as you think about these points, feel free to send an email to myself or Lori Lee. We've provided you the links to the practice guide and the PLC materials and the videos. And we will also post uh, a PDF of this PowerPoint, but we have to remove the videos won't be available within the PowerPoint because they're separate even as we do this uh, webinar because they're so huge. So we will provide that, we'll post that on the RHEL Southeast website. So thank you very much for attending. Hey, thank you all. We appreciate your time and have a great afternoon.